So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Axon. I'm the CEO of, of Prothelia. Thanks for inviting me to speak at the conference. Um, and also thanks for everyone for taking time out of their weekend to attend the conference. We know it's difficult to do this virtually, but it's great to get everyone together. Um, in order to do this presentation virtually, I unknowingly um, recruited my family to listen to this and, and to record this talk. Um, I also could not resist the opportunity of uh, flag dropping with, um, with everything that's going on these days. So Prothelia in brief. Um, Prothelia is a biotech company focused on the development of treatments for muscular dystrophy. Um, we have a primary focus on patients with LAMA2 congenital muscular dystrophy, and we're approaching this with our lead program, Recombinant Human Laminin 111, which is a protein replacement therapy for the missing protein in LAMA2 CMD. Preclinical proof of concept has been achieved by multiple researchers, and this year we've overcome key manufacturing hurdles that have held the program back in the past. Long term, we look to expand LAM 111 into Duchenne, and we're also looking at other programs in other muscular dystrophies. So, focusing on LAMA 2 today, um, LAMA 2 CMD patients are missing a critical protein. It's a structural protein called laminin 211, shown here. And it has a vital role in holding muscle cells and muscle fibers together. If we look at a normal, unaffected muscle, you see a hexagonal matrix of laminin 211 molecules sitting on the surface of a muscle cell. They're bound to the muscle cell to two key receptors, and they polymerize to each other, um, almost holding hands with each other to create that structural matrix on the surface of muscles. If you look at LAMA2 CMD patients affected muscle, there's a disorganized matrix of, of laminates. And what's going on here is mother nature is trying to compensate for the missing laminin 211 by upregulating laminin 411. Unfortunately, laminin 411 is deficient in a couple of different ways. So first of all, the alpha-4 chain is truncated and is not effective at polymerization. And secondly, the binding domains of laminin 411 do not bind to the muscle cells as laminin 211 does. Um, so this makes laminin 411 somewhat of an ineffective replacement for laminin 211. Um, on, on Prothelia's side, our drug, LAM111, on the right-hand side, um, if we look at a head-to-head -head comparison versus laminin-211, um, functionally, laminin-111 is the most similar laminin of the 17 laminin isoforms to laminin-211. They share the same beta-1 and gamma-1 chains. Alpha-1 is able to polymerize as effectively as alpha-2 is. They have identical binding to the key muscle cell receptors. And importantly, laminin 111 is an embryonic laminin, meaning that it is less likely to invoke a negative immune response if delivered to a patient. So if we go back and we look at that affected lamina 2 patient muscle with a disorganized matrix, um, and we look at our Prothelia's drug, laminin 111, as a protein replacement therapy, if we deliver laminin 111 systemically and the drug is able to get to muscle, we should be able to re rebuild that hexagonal matrix um, that is similar to the unaffected um, healthy muscle. Um, laminin 111 will bind to the key receptors and it will polymerize to itself and potentially to the other um, residual laminins, recreating that structural integrity of the muscle cell surface. So researchers have taken this hypothesis and have studied it in multiple mice models. And I'll show you a little bit of the data here. In 2012, Rooney and Al showed by systemically delivering um, laminin 111 that they were able to make the mice stronger, shown here by a mouse at 10 weeks that's laminin 111 treated, able to stand on its hind limbs versus an untreated mouse, unfortunately not able to use its hind limbs. They've, they've shown in 2020 in a different study that laminin 111 treated um, mice were much more active than untreated mice and even more active than mice treated with laminin 211 delivered in the same way that laminin 111 was delivered. And finally, they showed that the mice were able to live about three times longer when treated with a protein replacement therapy of laminin 111 versus being untreated. And the picture at the top is a 60 week old mouse that's been treated with laminin 111 protein replacement therapy, which would not exist in nature without the potential for, without the 
um, the treatment of 111. So this data um, led to the acquisition of this program by a biotech company in the US that looked to move this program forward into later stage preclinical and clinical development. Unfortunately, LAM111 is a um, large and complex protein as shown here in this three-dimensional structure. It is a 900 kilodalton heterotrimer that is proven extremely difficult to manufacture. And the company that acquired LAM111 um, ran into technical difficulties and returned the program to Pathelia. In 2000, 2016, 2017, Prothelia looked to tackle these technical challenges um, and try and move the program forward. And I wanna describe the technical challenges so you can see what we were working with. In past efforts, the production yield of LAM111 was extremely low, so low that it wasn't commercially viable to bring to patients. And secondly, and more importantly probably, the purity that they could achieve was less than 60%, meaning there were more than 40% process and product related impurities that could not be removed from the, from the protein, from the drug. Um, this would not be acceptable to regulators. So Prothelia um, partnered with two leading companies, uh, BioLamin in Sweden and Sevic in Germany that are experts in laminin manufacturing. And in 2020, we've been able to resolve and overcome these technical hurdles. We are currently producing the protein at about 100 times the production yields of past efforts, and we're able to purify the protein to greater than 98%. So based on these accomplishments on the manufacturing side, Prothelia was relaunched in 2020. We raised a large Series A with really strong European and US investors that have been involved in many successful rare disease companies. We have cash sufficient to take the company for three years. We're based in Boston, Massachusetts, and this is our team of seven employees currently that will be growing um, to 15 or 20 by the end of 2021. So we've made a lot of um, great strides over the last 12 to 18 months. And I wanna walk you through a little bit of the road ahead. So on the manufacturing side, we are very close to a final process and we now need to scale that up and confirm if LAM111 can be manufactured at scale. We then also need in parallel to look at what is a safe and effective dose in animals that ultimately could lead us to a clinical dose to take to patients. We need to understand what are the best clinical endpoints, and we're doing this by running uh, a couple of different natural history studies to really understand the natural history of LAMA 2 CMB. We have enough information, we have enough confidence in the program that we can get approval from regulators to start clinical trials. And then we would embark on a long-term clinical development program to confirm whether the drug is safe and effective in patients in, in, with an aim to achieve marketing authorizations in multiple countries, all of the countries around the world that have LAMA2 patients so that we can make this drug available to every patient that could benefit from our drug. Just briefly, I wanna to touch on the, on the natural history work that we're doing um, because we need your help a little bit here. Um, we have a retrospective review that we're doing. It's a medical chart review with Cure CMD. It's a remote study, no visits are required, and it's open to all ages. And in this study, we're collecting the medical records and we can do this in English, Dutch, Spanish, and also now in French and Arabic, um, looking to really fill in a gap in the natural history of LAMA2 um, in this zero to five age group. The enrollment is open um, and we're looking to recruit this study by the end of the year, the details can be found at clintrials.gov or reach out to us or Cure CMD. Secondly, there are initiatives for prospective natural history of LAMA2. There are ongoing studies in Spain and the Netherlands that are open to all ages with Dr. Vormans in the Netherlands and Dr. Munel in Spain. And Prothelia with a global consortium is initiating a global study next year um, that we will really look at the specific endpoints that we would like to consider taking into clinical trials for patients at zero to five. Um, we need your help to enroll in these studies. We need your help to raise awareness to these studies. These are critical for Prothelia's future clinical research and for other companies to come after us. I really wanna thank everyone for their attention and for taking the time to attend this conference and to listen to our talk. 
please visit our website, prothelia.com. If you have any questions, please let us know and we're happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Right, thank you so much. Uh, since at this moment, unfortunately, Prothelia is not present in the meeting, I propose to move on towards the next presentation. But if there are any yeah, questions, we're here. We're here. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, Tristan. Sorry, Tristan. I'm really sorry. Uh, are there any questions remaining for Prothelia? There's one in the chat. If if I could go ahead and read it, um, is this drug considered curative and would this ongoing medication uh, be required for support? And I can answer that. Um, yes, this would be an ongoing medication that would be taken either once or uh, once a week or once every two to three or four weeks, depending on the dose regimen. And yes, it would be for, for life. It would be ongoing. And I think the second question came from Krista and it's asking about retrospective versus prospective studies. And yes, that is a bit confusing. Retrospective means that we're looking into the past and prospective means that we're looking into the future. So for a retrospective study, we would gather all of the medical records from the past and extract the data that has been entered into those records and try and look for patterns. But the prospective studies that are being done in the Netherlands, in Spain, and soon to be a global effort will be moving forward. So we'll start, everyone will start about the same time and we'll look at visits every three to six months and everyone will have the same uh, measurements taken over that time so that we can look at change over the course of the study and participation. Maybe we should also, um, Tristan, respond to the question whether this could be considered curative or not. Uh, so that's always a difficult, if I may take a stop on that, that's always a difficult question in therapy development um, because if cure means the disease is completely disappearing after you treat, uh, uh, take the medication, then that would be um, not an uh, appropriate um, expectation. However, a therapeutic effect is an appropriate expectation. So it's always better to talk about therapies at this point in time. Um, but among therapies, of course, this is a, a type of therapy that goes to the root cause of the disease, which is to uh, replace the missing protein with something that's expected to be uh, equally uh, functional and then the missing one. So it's a, it's a root cause treatment, if you will, but um, I think uh, cure is always a loaded term. Um, and so I think therapy is, is, uh, is probably the best terminology here. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. That was very helpful. I did make a, a point of clarification that for any of these clinical studies, whether it's the retrospective study or the prospective studies, that all patients have to sign an informed consent or the parent can sign on behalf of the child uh, for certain ages. So we, we need your help. We can't assume that you want to participate or begin to look at your medical information without your permission. So please contact CureCMD if you'd like to be participate in the retrospective study or uh, to Carlin for the natural history study in the Netherlands or Dr. Francina Munel for the study in Spain. Okay, and as a final question from Ashley right now, could this medication by be used in conjunction with gene therapy that might be upcoming? Would use of the medication exclude them from future gene therapies? We believe that they could be used in conjunction with one another. So if you were to participate in the protein replacement therapy clinical trial, you would still be eligible for a future uh, gene therapy study. As with any drug, uh, the protein replacement therapy can be washed out of the system. So if you stop taking it, if you stop having that drug, it will then go lower, lower, lower in your body and eventually wash out and you would be eligible to try another therapy of any type. Thank you for that. And then I can, um, sorry, but, but another editorial comment, uh, mm -hmm. which is, um, 
that uh, in a disease as significant as LAMA2 congenital muscular dystrophy, of course, in the future, we have to think about multimodal therapeutics. So to attack the disease from more than one angle, um, that, uh, as I said, every disease is a therapy, but maybe if we put several of these, uh, every, every approach is a therapy, but if we put several of these therapies together in the end, maybe we are even more effective than every single one. So that's, I think, is what the future holds. Uh, multimodal therapeutics, uh, meaning that we have to move at different fronts at the same time.